Hello, everyone. Welcome to another round of Bilkent Micro Webinar Series. Today's speaker is Gabriele Graton, uh, and he is also joined by Barton Lee among the panelists here, uh, who is co his co-author, and he's going to be talking about liberty, secu security, and accountability, the rise and fall of illiberal democracies. Gabriele, you have the board. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today. No, thank you. Thank you so much for, uh, for inviting me. Uh, I wish one day to actually come to Ankara, but uh, given the circumstances, it is as close as I can get, and it's, and it's great. Uh, so yes, this is a joint work with uh, Barton, who is also here and may, may help answering further questions. And it's about the rise and fall of a liberal democracy. So let me begin by giving you an idea of what we have in mind when we're thinking about the liberal democracy and what perhaps we would like you to have in mind uh, during, during the talk. And the kind of recent examples that we are, we are thinking of are those of Poland, uh, perhaps Turkey, uh, Hungary, maybe even the United States in the last decade, countries in which uh, governments rose to power in by large free elections, therefore with significant popular support, and uh, to different extents, of course, but infringe fundamental liberal rights once in power. They did so, perhaps not respecting the spirit of their respective constitutions, but formally or abstentionally uh, respecting the uh, letter of those constitutions. So they didn't take power over the, over the constitution in any formal, formal sense. And one of the dimensions across which they, they force their constitution, they respect the elected but not the spirit, is that the way that they have manipulated the information that is observed by voters, either by censoring bureaucrats from reporting um, in, in unfavorable information to institutions, in, therefore indirectly, but also directly to the voters, um, but also by intimidating media, for example, by uh, a, um, uh, you know, uh, withholding funds uh, from, uh, for advertising from uh, publicly owned companies. And perhaps this ability to go beyond uh, the, uh, the constitutional constraints on executives and manipulate information is beyond also their uh, substantial uh, popular success in, in, in terms of re-election. You know, some of these, uh, some of these uh, uh, illiberal governments uh, have, have fallen and some instead have maintained substantial popular support to the level necessary for, for being re-elected in, again, by and large, uh, free elections. And so, you know, this is uh, a phenomenon that I made some, some, some example, but it's a phenomenon that perhaps is is beyond what some are calling a new wave of autocratization in the past uh, decade, a wave of, of autocratization that is hitting countries that maybe uh, up until quite recently we would have considered as fully consolidated and stable democracies, including in fact the, the, the United States, which it might be uh, an, uh, an example of a country that uh, most people would have considered a very stable uh, democratic constitution. And so what we want to do in this, in this paper, we want to get a framework to think about illiberal democracies and uh, how democracies become illiberal and how they come back to liberality, if you want. And we want to do this basing our framework on two key premises. And the first premise is that voters in democracies value both what we are going to end up calling with this umbrella word, if you want, liberty, and they value security. And what I mean by voters value liberty is that voters value individual freedoms, value also the rule of law. They have procedural preferences. But perhaps even more broadly, what I really mean here is that all else equal, most of us prefer a more free and a more just world. We also care about others, we care about minorities, we prefer all else equal to have a better world around us. But the key here is that all else equal, in the sense that we also care about what we're gonna call here security. We care about our own economic welfare, our own, our own economic security, our own physical security. And so if you want the kind of trade-offs that we have in mind here is, Think of me as a, as a worker in an industry 
and, and I'm really worried about uh, the effect of uh, you know uh, some sort of export shock on my industry. I'm gonna I'm scared that I'm gonna lose my job, and then I'm gonna think like you know maybe maybe it would be nice if there was a law that says that firms need to fire first non-native workers or first non-citizens or first you know. These are policies that, in principles, I really don't like. I don't think they're fair. But, you know, once I am sufficiently concerned about my own economic stability, my own economic security, I may start to consider them. And so I'm, I'm willing to trade off some liberty for my own security. But all else equal, I would prefer more, secure, more liberty uh, if possible. And of course, you know, I want you to have in mind that this doesn't mean that we all value liberty and security the same. And that obviously there are people that value liberty much less than others, right? So much so that you might even think that somebody may have a negative value of liberty if you really prefer to think so. So that's the first premise. And the second premise is that when we write constitution, we write them with explicitly in mind the, the writing constraints on executives that are aimed at guaranteeing liberty. Um, you can think of constraints on uh, the power of majority, so anti-majoritarian uh, institution like uh, you know uh, Supreme Courts, or, or but also you might want to think about the fact that we uh, want to have uh, bureaucratic agencies that provide the information and provide uh, also uh, scorecards to policies that are sufficiently independent, and we want the media that provide information to voters to be sufficiently independent. So we write constitution to put these limits that keep liberty, but de facto, these are just words that we write down. And de facto, governments are substantially way beyond the letter of constitutions, and their true limit to their power is political accountability, is whether uh, parliaments and voters and courts are willing really to try to stop it. And so with these two premises in mind, we, can start thinking about illiberal, illiberal governments in the terms of these premises. And what, what is an illiberal government? An illiberal government is one that, can, that promises voters to force the constitution, to work beyond the letter of the, 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 the spirit of the constitution, perhaps respecting only the letter, but offering to voters something that voters may sometime at least you know, value even more than liberty itself, that is security. I can say, look, it's written that I shouldn't, uh, you know, make a discrimination based on religion. But, you know, I might also uh, deport every Muslim in, in the country. You know, let's see if they stop me. Okay, and so that's that's that, that's the offer of the of the liberal government: the ability of working beyond the spirit of the constitution by giving to voters more security but of course restricting liberty. And so as a voter, I may think that I may want to trade off some time liberty for security because you know, I'm in particularly bad times. The problem is that as a voter, I also understand that once I elect a government that is going to operate beyond the uh, constitutional constraints on the executive, that will also be a government that is gonna be able to stop bureaucrats, stop judges from doing their jobs uh, and, and, and uh, intimidate the media. And so I will also know that this government is gonna manipulate the information that I see. And so it's gonna be harder for me under this government to optimally choose whether to uh, keep this government in power or to get a new government. And so what I do have is that I don't just trade off statically liberty for security, but I also dynamically trade off liberty and security today with an endogenously determined amount of accountability, endogenously determined by how much these illiberal governments are going to be willing to manipulate information in a career. And so why do we want to do this? Why do we want to capture this dynamic trade-off? Because we think that uh, a lot of attention has been uh, placed uh, on the rise of illiberal democracies, of course, but something that bothers us is the idea that some of these illiberal democracies fail and fall very soon while others thrive and, and, and keep going. And so we think that if you want to understand really the dynamic of, of the rise of the liberal democracy, we need to understand the dynamics of what happens once they are in power and what makes them fall and what makes us return to liberal democracy. And in order to do that, we need to capture this dynamic problem between you know, 
what I want from the liberal government today and what I fear this liberal government is gonna do is gonna do tomorrow. And so we wanna deliver a theory of both the rise and the fall of liberal democracy. And in doing, you know, we wanted to start doing this, we you know we have some, some kind of objective in mind. And one objective is that we do realize that of course we're talking about a uh, multifaceted, multidimensional phenomenon that, you know, in the examples that I made to you before, in each of those, there, is, there are different dimensions that may matter, but we want to try to capture some aspect of it that we think is across these experiences, and we think that we can capture with this very, very simple uh, trade-off between liberty and security and dynamic and endogenous accountability. But also we want to do this in, if you want the most natural framework for us economists, something, you know, a fully uh, rational, Bayesian, forward-looking, infinitely lived voter. And in doing this, we need to have a, a nice uh, way to think about information manipulation. We want to have it as simple as possible. And so we borrow from the Bayesian persuasion literature, the, the model of information manipulation, you know, really because we think this is the simplest way to capture the idea that uh, governments can manipulate information, but they cannot, you know, fully react to everything that happens. I can set the bureaucracy in a way that I decrease the probability of whistleblowers, but once the whistle has been blown, you know, I can't cover it up anymore, okay? And so we think that this, the Bayesian persuasion model comes to this idea that I, I commit to a policy of, of censorship, if you want, and you, everybody can see what kind of censorship I put in place, uh, but then I cannot re, re garble messages later on. Okay, so this is the why, and uh, you know, in some sense, what, I mean, what are we gonna conclude? Well, what I'm gonna try to show you is that uh, this gives us a model that is, first of all, rich in the sense that depending on the value of the parameters of the model, the values that we're gonna call of the constitution that we have, so how much constraints there are on the executive, how transparent is the, the bureaucracy is, uh, our model induces different regimes. We're gonna have stable democracies that are stably liberal or stably liberal, but also we're gonna describe cycles of liberality and illiberality. And in the model, what, what triggers the rise of the liberal democracy are, are crises in the sense that voters are, are scared, they are worried for their, uh, for their welfare, for their security, and, and the voters optimally choose to resort to liberal governments, but in, in equilibrium, liberal governments always live too long, even for the pivotal voter who chose them, not only you know, from a welfare perspective, and we return on this a, a couple of times, but it, it, importantly, even for the voter who decided to have the liberal government, the liberal governments are gonna stay in power for too long. We're going to talk about the probability of a rise of the liberal government, how it depends on the constraints on the executive and how it interacts uh, with the level of transparency. And I think that the key message here is going to be that we need institutions that are somewhat more flexible and they, the way, the, the amount of flexibility about, of the institutions depends on other things such as the information technology, how it develops. And I, I'll try to speak more about that. And finally, I'll, I'll talk about extending our model to allow illiberal governments to become full autocracies and to overthrow all checks and balances. And again, our key message here is going to be that having stronger checks and balances is a bit of a double-edged sword, really, because on the one hand, it's going to slow down processes of, processes of autocratization, but it may actually induce autocratization to be more likely. Indeed, it can make, them, it can make it certain in the long run and why? Because it creates, maybe if I want to speak a bit beyond the model, it creates a false sense of security in the voters. They, they are going to uh, uh, be more willing to experiment with a short term, or they hope to be a short term uh, illiberal government, and then they get stuck with it. Okay. Now, I'm going to, of course, get back to each of these results with the model, so it's going to be clearer what I, what I mean by them. But before doing that, I want to kind of send the message that our contribution here is, is theoretical, but we think we are trying to capture important things that are out there in the world. It's not just, you know, uh, making a model of, of a thought that, that, that we had. And so what I'm plotting here uh, to, to, to show uh, briefly this, this point is 
one of the key premises of our, for, for, for our story is that it is true that if as a voter, I'm more worried about my, my security, I'm going to place less value on aspects of democracy that we think are, are connected with the liberality of democracy. So in the left hand uh, panels here on the left, I have on the X axis uh, responses to how much you're scared of terrorist attacks. And on the right panels on the x-axis is how much are you scared that you're going to lose your job or not being able to find a job. And on the vertical axis, on the top two panels, I have how many people respond uh, more than average so that civil rights are an essential component of democracy. So a, a measure of, of, of liberality of democracy rather than just you know, majority rules. And on the bottom two panels, I have instead the responses to, I think that I want to have, a, a, I support a, the idea of a strong leader that does not need to bother with parliament courts, okay? And what I have here, even restricting to this highly consolidated democracy sample, these I'm, I'm really talking about Sweden and France and Germany. Even in these countries, you observe this connection between fears for your own welfare, fears for your own security, and less liberal preferences. I want a strong leader that solves my problems. I don't care about parliaments and the rule of law. I want, uh, you know, to solve the economy's problems. I don't care about civil rights, okay? And this I'm talking about even just a sample of highly consolidated democracy. And instead, you know, we don't observe the same pattern if we ask people, do you like democracy, right? If, if, if I'm very much scared about terrorism, I, you know, I support democracy roughly as much as if I'm not scared at all about terrorism. And I know that right here you might see a not particularly significant uh, kind of view pattern. But again, if, you know, this is the, I'm, I'm focusing on highly consolidated democracies where there is a bit of a more, you know, noise. If I look at um, the entire set of democracies, I have even a more flat picture, okay? Uh, so it seems that, you know, concerns about welfare is, is, is something that doesn't make me abandon the idea that I want, you know, one man, one vote, but it makes me abandon the idea that we should have all these complex procedures to respect minorities, okay? And that's, that's, that's key to our story. But even more, uh, you know, if you want, uh, uh, essential to, to, our, to our message, because it comes from really the results of our theory, is the idea that, you shouldn't always react this way as a voter, right? As a voter in, in our model, you're not necessarily uh, concerned about dropping liberty and you don't necessarily want a strong leader in particular uh, because you're concerned about your, your wealth. You want that only when you think that your government doesn't have enough power to actually respond to your needs. You only think that uh, you want a strong leader when there are too many and too stringent uh, constraints on, on the executive. And that's, again, this is no claim of causality whatsoever. It's just a bunch of regression put out there. But again, that's exactly what we, we had in the data. That this connection between uh, fear of terrorism or fear of losing your job and the support for a strong leader is really only there uh, in countries that have a particularly strong set of constraints on the executive, where this measure we take it from some, a paper by, by Tim Besley, uh, because we don't want to be us choosing, deciding any, any of this measure. Okay? So again, this is my motivation, I, I, but I wanted to make clear that, you know, it, it's a theory paper, it's a theory contribution, but we're not trying to, you know, make a fancy model, we wanna, we wanna talk about some reality out there that we think very much. Okay, so if, if you're okay with why we're doing this. Gabriele, can I ask something? Absolutely, Nin. Uh, will, you say, will you say something about possible cross-country effects? So something like, you know, having uh, illiberal democracies or strongman governments around may increase voters' inclination to vote for such governments in country in a given country? Uh, in so far as you may think that there is, for example, a, a, a connection 
between uh, uh, what we call the you know the democratic piece and, and liberal aspect of democracy. So if you think that in liberal uh, governments, in democracies are more inclined, for example, to have an aggressive diplomatic stance to their neighboring countries, then you know a, a kind of immediate implication of our of our theory would be that voters in the neighboring countries now they want a more effective government that is going to be more hawkish. Right? And so they may be more inclined to get a, a, a hawkish government itself uh, 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 and the foreign liberal government. So yes, we haven't we haven't thought about it. Uh, perhaps you're right that we should mention this at some point in the paper. Uh, we, we didn't, but yes, it, it's, uh, it's kind of a relatively obvious next question. Yes. Okay, thanks. Do we have other, other questions right now? To be a good moment before I get into the theory. All right, so I'll do that. I'll do it. Uh, I'll introduce the theory with a, with a bit, bit of a wordy slide about the, the elements of the model in a very informal way, and then get you know, to the to the actual model for the for the theorists in the room. Uh, so it's uh, it, it, in in our in our model there is going to be a voter. I will return a little bit about what we mean by the single voter. So hold on on that question for a second. But it's going to be a, a single voter who's going to value both liberty and security in the sense. That this voter in every field will be able to choose between a liberal government and an illiberal government. And the liberal government will offer liberty because we respect the constitution and it's committed to do so. But of course, by respecting the constitution, it may be unable to, we call here, yeah, stop us a threat. But you can think of it as, you know, respond to a, 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 an economic shock that happens uh, during that period. And the probability that a liberal government is unable to respond to this shock, to, to stop this threat, is going to be increasing in how many constraints, how stringent the constraints that the constitution places on this. Right? The constitution is really not allowing the government to do anything without six different votes in parliament, then the government is not going to be able to really respond to more of, this, uh, of these threats. If the constitution is more flexible, allows for more emergency powers and so on, then the probability that the liberal government can respond is, is great. And so the probability that the, that the liberal government cannot respond is going to be small. And if the uh, liberal government does not manage to stop this threat, does not manage to respond to this shock, uh, then the voter suffers a cost of security, uh, which you're going to call uh, capital X. Now, the other option for me as a voter is to elect an illiberal government. And an illiberal government is an insurance. The illiberal government does not respect the Constitution, so it doesn't offer me much liberty at all. But on the other hand, it can do whatever. If there is a terrorist uh, people, they can use all sorts of uh, illegal uh, uh, ways of uh, dismantling the organization. Or if there is a, an economic shock uh, that uh, reduces labor, labor demand, they can uh, decide that uh, only native workers can work. And so I I'm happy with that. Okay, so it's, a, it's an insurance for me. But the key assumption of the model is that the information that the voter observes about next period threat, whether it's of the type that the, the, the liberal government can or cannot stop, depends on two things. It depends on the transparency of the institution that my constitution gives me. So the independence of the bureaucracy, the independence of the media and the freedom and competitivity of the media. But it also depends on which government I have. Because if I have chosen in the past a liberal government, then I can observe what the, bureaucracy, the bureaucrats are trying to tell me, and I can see free media telling me their opinion about it. But if I elected an illiberal government, that is illiberal government can strategically manipulate the information I observe, and we're going to call this strategic manipulation a censorship policy. But of course, for those of you familiar with uh, the Asian persuasion literature, it's of course, it can be any sort of mapping, including adding noise, if you prefer. Okay. So, so then, the, sorry, yes. just to make sure that I understand. So an illiberal government always ensures from threats, regardless of the executive constraints. So executive constraints are only binding for liberal governments in this model? Yes. Okay. Yes. So, yeah, I, I think it's, it's going to be very clear in this slide, but yes, absolutely. So the, the very simple framework is one in which there are some constraints that if you are a liberal government, you're going to respect them. 
that guarantees liberty for everybody, but it also it means that sometimes you cannot do things. If you're in a liberal government, you do whatever you want, but of course, you know, your voters want, uh, want that you kill everybody who, you know, says B, you kill them. You know, whatever they want, you'll do it. Okay. I mean? Uh, so just a clarifying question. Um, so are you implicitly assuming that constitution is ideal and voters are perfectly happy with it. Because maybe the constitution is somehow, for some reason, it's not ideal. So people are already not so happy with the constitution. So deviations from constitution are not necessarily illiberal actions. Why am I assuming that it's ideal, the constitution? Uh, in the previous slide, so maybe I got it wrong, but I thought that, like, uh, in your model, uh, liberty and following the Constitution goes hand in hand. Did I get it wrong? So no, if, yeah. you, if you, you violate right. Constitution... You got, you got that right? Yeah, yeah you so, got that right. So maybe Constitution is not a good one. So violating the Constitution is not necessarily an illiberal act. No, maybe for some because, reason, no, constitution, no, no, no. I mean, people are I mean, not happy I mean, with the constitution. I mean, I mean, here we are, you are conflating two terms. Sorry if I, if I, if I say it. You're yeah. conflating liberal with good. Liberal is not good. Okay. Liberal means liberal. Okay. Liberal means rule of law. So, okay. Okay, good. Yeah, thanks. The constitution gives something that voters want, but it also forbids other things that other ones. So the trade-off is exactly what I'm talking about. The constitution can be too much in one direction, too much in the other. Liberal means respecting the constitution. Okay. Can that's can the, all the language that we are using here. I, okay. I understand that it's somewhat arbitrary, but this is exactly the use of the term we are making here. Liberal means respecting the constitution. Can I ask okay. a somewhat related question? So Please. do you... It, are executive constraints a parameter in your model? Like, yes. Uh, so if there were no executive constraints, would a liberal government do as well a job in preventing the threats as a as an illiberal government? Uh, give me three slides. Okay. Yeah. And I think I'll answer, but I'll, I'll, I'll then say Arda, and, and you will know that it's, it's the moment in which you have to tell me whether you're satisfied or not with that. Yeah, you can say my name in a time. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so uh, let me give you the, the formal version of the model. So there is a voter who lives infinitely many periods. Generic period is T. And in each period T, the, the voter needs to choose a government. The government of the period T is GT. It can be an I government and an L government, I for the illiberal, L for liberal. And by choosing government, you get a payoff. And the, the payoff that you get depends on the government GT and on some unknown state theta T. So that if you elect a liberal government, you're going to get a payoff of L because you get liberty, minus your cost of security S, if and only if theta T are happens to be equal to one. Getting, uh, choosing an a illiberal government uh, neutralizes the threat, but it gives no, no, no liberty. So it gives you exactly T. So notice Arda, that, that L is, uh, is, uh, is uh, um, a parameter independent of anything else for now. Uh, the, the state theta T is, you know, what does it mean that theta T is equal to one? It means that it happened that the world was such that uh, in this period, a liberal government could not uh, respond to the, to the threat that, uh, that happened in this period. And the probability pi in which this happens is what we call the intensity of the executive constraints. If you prefer to think of these as there are many possible types of threats and uh, my constraints are, are like simply a blanket that covers a, a subset of these threats and those ones I can't stop them, then, you know, pi will be the, the probability measure of this subset and, and then you end up with the same. Okay, and then the second part, the key assumption of the model is that what as a voter I observe about information about theta t depends on the government that, that I chose in the previous period. So it depends on GT minus one. 
if in particular I chose a liberal government, so if GT minus one is L, then I see a message MT, which is gonna be equal to a signal ST of precision Q. And this precision Q is gonna measure how good in, in a, well, as long as the constitution is respected, how good and transparent and informative the bureau and the media in this country are. But if I chose an illiberal government in the past period, so GT minus one is equal to I, then the government will choose any stochastic mapping CT from the signal ST to the message MT. And we're gonna call the stochastic mapping CT a censorship policy. And now, of course, there are players here, the voter and the liberal government. I need to tell you what they want. The voter, you, I told you, wants to maximize the future sum of this of, of these payoffs. What does the liberal government care about? The liberal government wants to remain in power as long as possible. Okay, so it maximizes its own lifespan. So the assumption here is that today's Trump cares about remaining in power. He doesn't care about a future Trump that may arise uh, 20 or 50 years from now. And then some discount factor, that of course, you know, it's going to play uh, no, no interesting role here, so I'm, I'm not going to talk about it. Okay, so a few things about the model that I hope answer partially what, uh, what Ardo uh, said. Uh, first, as I said, there is a single voter in the model, but I don't want, I would really not like us to think of the model as really a representative this is not a representative voter. This is going to be some pivotal voter. I mean, you can think of them being the medium voter, but you know, whoever is pivotal. And if you're thinking about the medium voter, then I can tell you that this would be the voter who has the median relative value of liberty. Well, relative value of liberty means the value of liberty over the value of security. And this matters. And the reason why it matters is because if there are heterogeneous uh, values of liberty and security, then the pivotal voters uh, payoff is not equal to wealth, right? It may be that this that the pivotal voter is one that doesn't care much about liberty, uh, but the minorities are minorities. They're not pivotal, but they care really a lot about liberty, okay? <laughs> and so I, I, I believe that uh, you can think of uh, ethnic minorities in countries uh, in a very familiar way. You can think about what, what they care about. And second thing, I will treat the elements of our constitution the constraint and the executive pie, the quality and independence and transparency of, of bureaucracy and media Q, and the amount of liberty guaranteed by the constitution L as independent elements in, in I'll do compatible statics on each of them. But of course, if we think about designing constitution, we can't be so blind to think that I can, you know, impose very little constraints on the executive, so pi is zero, but L is still large, right? Obviously, if I want to guarantee liberty, I need to place some, some constraints on the executive. And if I want to guarantee information, transparency, Q being high, I need to impose constraints on the executive. So I'll treat these parameters as in the, in independent, but when I will return to welfare consideration and the constitutional design, I will impose constraints of the form that you know, L and Q are increasing functions of, of pi. And of course, I'll do much more of that in the paper rather than in this presentation, but, 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 but that's a bit. Arda, did I answer your question? Um, I think, I mean, within the purpose, so, yeah, within the boundaries of this model, my question is, are you assuming that L is larger than S? I, is there no. a... No, no, I'm not assuming that L is larger than S, am I? I don't think it's needed for any of the things I'm going to say. Of course, there, there are going to be times in which it matters and times in which it doesn't matter. No, no, I, I think it but should be- But if L is larger than S- If L is larger than S, this is a stupid thing anyway. Right? So yeah, right, you don't care, right? Right? You all, But of course, I mean, the way, exactly the way I want to think is, I think that I'm an ideological person that likes democracy, likes it to be liberal. I'm probably a person for which L is really large. Because, but, you know, I don't know, because I am ideologically so, because my conditions are such that my S is more because, or my theta is so rare. But, but that, but that, you know, of course there are different people. But no, we don't ask that. No, no, I agree. Okay, fine, fine. I, I'm going to ask one more question, and that's a very stupid question. Uh, no. So the, the ST, it's a signal of what? It's a signal of theta? Of t yeah, yeah. So it's like uh, you, you can think of this as uh, is, is, is a binary variable that takes value one with probability 
q if the state theta is actually one and okay. it takes value uh, one with probability one minus q if the state theta is uh, zero okay thank you something it's 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 really for simple sim you know, it doesn't need to be a value it could be whatever okay so that 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 that's the model with the caveats that i said and also the the, the what we think the way we wanted to think about it and you know let me give you the the keys to the analysis and let me start with like I'll be quite brief about the analysis. Uh, this is going to be disappointing for some of you that like a lot of uh, a lot of uh, of, of modeling. Uh, I, but I, I feel I want to give you the, what are the key trade-offs? What are the things that I keep in mind that drive the the results? And the key trade-offs are one for the voter and one for the liberal government once it's in power, right? So what what does the voter want? The voters need to choose whether to get a liberal or a liberal government. And how do I choose it? Well, I'm going to choose an illiberal government whenever. The left hand side here, what is this? This is the expected cost of security. Given my belief, and my belief will depend on the message that I observe and whatever censorship policy is, is out there, right? So if it's a liberal government, the censorship policy is, is one that lets everything be seen, otherwise, it's something that they censor it. So if the expected cost of security is greater than something, I'll choose a liberal government. What is that sum? Well, I'll trade off liberty, security with liberty. So the expected cost of security is greater than liberty, but also liberty plus something else. And what is this something else? This is a discounted accountability cost of having a liberal government. And what is this accountability cost is going to depend on? It's going to depend on my expectation about how much censorship there would be tomorrow if I choose an illiberal government today. Because the more there's going to be censorship tomorrow, the less informed I will be when I will choose a government for tomorrow. And so the less likely I will be to choose the correct government. I want to choose a liberal government when it's less likely that theta is equal to one. I want to choose a, a liberal government when it's very likely that theta is equal to one, right? And so this is going to be endogenously determined by what I expect an illiberal government to do in equilibrium. And what a liberal government would do in equilibrium if I elect it? Well, it will censor. How much it will censor? Well, there are two key scenarios to keep in mind. One in which the liberal government may uh, ensure its own re-election. If it can ensure its own re-election, then it might as well ensure its own re-election by censoring everything. And we remain with the liberality for them. Otherwise, if the liberal government cannot ensure its own re-election, then it will have to censor only partially. And censor only partially boils down to sending two messages. One message that basically reveals that, uh, you know, yeah, the information of this period is that you should really return to a liberal government and uh, the voter will follow suit and will return to liberal government. Otherwise, the other message is one that keeps the voter exactly indifferent between staying with a liberal government and not staying with a liberal government. And if you're familiar with the uh, Bayesian persuasion, which this result should not surprise you, but you see that this is just the indifference condition uh, about uh, this, this, this choice of the voter. Okay, so these are the two key results that drive all the results. And what are the results? The results is that depending on the parameters of the model, so depending on the constitution that I have, the uh, executive constraint phi, the transparency of, of institutions Q, and the uh, uh, relative value of liberty over security, L bar, we're going to call it here, I can have different regimes. I can have uh, efficient, stable, illiberal democracy. These are worlds in which security is so much more important than liberty that I'm going to always get a liberal goal. Doesn't matter. I'm going to have instead. Uh, a world in which voters value liberty a lot and the constitution is sufficiently flexible. I'm going to stay forever with a stable liberal government. But there are in the middle more in, in interesting regimes in which I can get an inefficient stable and liberal de democracy or even cycles of liberal and liberal democracy. I think that inefficient stable and liberal democracy is the one that really uh, highlights the, the, the key story here the, about the trade offs that I said before. What's an inefficient, stable, and liberal democracy? It's a regime in which eventually, although not necessarily immediately, eventually the voter will resort to an illiberal government. At some point, it will be sufficiently scared and say, okay, 
are getting liberal. Once he gets the liberal government, the voter knows that this illiberal government will be able to censor information so much to, as to ensure its own reelection forever. And the voter knows that this will be suboptimal in the future, but today is sufficiently scary. So I know I voluntarily choose to get a government that will censor information forever and stay in power forever because I want today, I want sufficient, uh, sufficient security. But I can also have cycles of liberal and illiberal democracy because the, you know, these are the cases in which the liberal government cannot fully censor and, and ensure its own election. But in this case, it's still it will be true that the voter knows that once he chooses or she chooses an illiberal government, this illiberal government will be able to stay in power longer than it would be optimal for the people. Because again, the, you know, she knows that the illiberal government will be able to censor information optimally to stay in power as long as possible. Now, okay. Really, uh, yes. A, I mean. a clarifying question. So uh, you say that uh, the illiberal government can censor information so much that uh, it uh, ensures re-election, right? So if I'm if I'm the voter and if I know that the government can do this kind of censorship, so why am I still basing my voting decision on what I see. You don't. Why, why, can I, why can't I do the following? Well, I know that he's doing complete censorship, so any signal I receive, any message I receive is complete uh, unreal. unreal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So no, no, I, no, I will choose a liberal government. Then, no, you don't. So suppose that the world is such that, unless you read the newspapers about this year, you think that the PKK is pretty strong and pretty active. Mm -hmm. I don't know if this is the right example, but either, bear with me, okay? Now, suppose that, you know, the reason why you are willing to have a liberal democracy and negotiations and, and political participation is because you read the newspaper and you know that right now things are, are pretty peaceful. You you. It's a good moment for negotiating. It's a good moment for respecting the rule of law. But suppose that absent any information, your prior is that you should be really worried about the PKK, you know, uh, uh, terrorism. Now you elected me and you know that all the newspapers from now on are going to just send garbage. You cannot understand anything of what's written there. Then you, ret you return to your prior. And your prior is that I am better than, than the other government because I'm the one that fights the PKK harder. And so if there is a period in which you're sufficiently scared, you're gonna elect me and you know that from then on, you're gonna elect me forever. Uh, Gabriele, I, uh, I mean, can I? Yeah, sure. Uh, do you have another? Yeah. Uh, so the, the so basically, uh, but still the, the, the final message that's sent to the citizens is stochastic, right? So even this inefficient state illiberal, is it going to last forever or by, there is a chance that it's going to... In, in this region? Yes. Under this middle line? Yes. Right? So basically, uh, you can think of this as under the middle line, the uh, uh, illiberal government always sends the same signal independent of the state, right? So whatever okay, is yeah, the real yeah, okay. state, this is a complete, you know, if you think on the terms of the Bayesian persuasion literature, this is a completely non-meaningful experiment. See. It's an experiment that always gives positive or always gives negative, whatever you I want. See. So in the cycling liberal illiberal, no, so illiberal distorts a little bit, but there is a probability that it's... Exactly, right? and that's why it keeps being stochastic and that's what that's why, and that drives a lot of the results that I'm gonna go pretty, how much I have, remind me. Uh, you have 40 minutes. How many? 40 minutes, I think. Oh, okay, well, thank you. I won't, I won't <laughs> use that. I won't use that because I, I won't have any voice <laughs> in 40 minutes from now. <laughs> okay, so let me do some comparative studies, maybe. Let me introduce the compact studies by just looking again at these di uh, diagrams. Now, you can see that these are two diagrams. In the left one, we, we're talking about the states in the space pi L bar. In, in the right, 
graph, we're going to talk about the states in the space Q L bar. And what you can see is that two things. One, the Copadi statics seem to be somewhat complex. They're, they're not necessarily so, so, so linear or even so monotonic at, at first look. And second, you can see that the comparative statics with respect to Q may depend on where pi is. Here pi is high, but if I move it down, it may switch how these lines go, right? And so that's exactly the key, the key, the key set of results. So first, what induces countries to do the transition between liberal from liberal to illiberal democracy? So what causes the rise of an illiberal democracy? The probability of a rise of an illiberal democracy is going to be very intuitively increasing in the amount of executive constraints, right? If I have a constitution that doesn't allow liberal governments to protect me enough, then it's more likely that at some point I say, okay, look, I'm scared. I want to get, I want to get an illiberal government. Also, it's going to be <coughs> very intuitively decreasing in the relative value of liberty. If the people that voted doesn't care about liberty, obviously, it's more likely that it's going to resort to an illiberal government. But it also is going to depend on the amount of transparency of institutions. And without going through all the cases, I want to note two things. First, it is not necessarily monotonic. You can see that it's single peaked in Q or U shaped in Q, for example. But also, it Importantly, it depends on pi. It depends on whether pi is large or small. So the how transparency of institutions affect uh, my choice to uh, get a liberal government depends on how how restrictive is the constitution uh, to the to the to the government. And so here is where I wanted the, the pen, but I'm going to do it with uh, you guys. See my little hand, right? Okay. Cool. So let me uh, look at this right-hand panel. So on the x-axis, I have Q, the, the, how informative the bureaucracy and the media are. On the vertical axis, I have how much I value liberty. And I, I put a point here at pi, right? So suppose I start somewhere here. Whoa, okay. Somewhere here. This means Q is very small. So now I am... You know, somebody who, who, who doesn't observe any informative newspapers, any informative bureaucracy, my country is a mess, okay? I don't get much information. But I value liberty quite a bit compared to pi, which is the expectation about security, right? Uh, you, know, you can normalize S to one and then pi is just the expected cost of security. And so as long as I'm here, my prior is that, well, you know, I'm not, I shouldn't be very scared about security. Let's stick with a liberal government, right? And now suppose that you make Q greater. Now what happens when you make Q greater is that when I observe a signal that says, or a newspaper article that says, oh, you should be worried this year. Before I thought it was very not informative. Now I think it's a bit more informative. So whenever I observe some scary news, I believe them more because I know that the media are, are, are better and more informed or the bureaucracy is, is, is uh, uh, more informative. So much so that if I cross this line, what happens? It happens when I cross this line, it happens that every time I see the signal that says that uh, uh, theta is equal to one, so the signal one, let's call it, I, I will now switch to an illiberal government. So now you increase the probability that I uh, choose an illiberal government. And what happens if you move even further to the right? Well, if you move further to the right, you're making, again, the signal more and more informative. And the signal is about a variable that is a binary variable, zero, one, and the probability that it's equal to one, it's pi. If pi is greater than one half, like in this example, you can see that the more you make the signal informative, the more likely it is, it is that it's equal to one. And so the probability that I choose in the liberal government keeps increasing, okay? And, you know, these two diagrams, you can use them and play with them and get all the possible cases in our, in our model and all the stories that, that, that we tell you in, in the paper. And now, as you see, I'm not going to go through all of these comparative statics, but I wanted to give you one as an example. And what the paper is about to a level is, you know, telling the stories, telling what, what, what these different cases uh, represent and giving the condition. And a second type of comparative studies that we can talk about is how much censorship there will be once the illiberal government gets in power. And again, 
the liberal government, once it gets in power, it can afford to censor more if there are uh, more constraints on, on the executive place by the constitution. Why? Because uh, the voter has less appetite to return to liberal democracy anyway. Also, obviously, an illiberal government doesn't need to censor much if the voter doesn't care about liberty in the first place. So, of course, it's going to censor a lot. But again, how it depends on transparency of institutions. Well, again, it can be both increasing. So I can both censor more because institutions are more transparent or censor less because institutions are more transparent, depending on how stringent are the constraints of the executive in the first place. So let me give you an intuition of what's going on. The intuition is that there are two effects up here. One is the common effect of the persuasion, Bayesian persuasion literature. So we, so we call it the persuasion effect. Well, what's the story here? Well, Think of it, the uh, Q represents how informative the word is before I censor, right? So for a given amount of how much I'm censoring the signal that you're observing, if the signal underlying there is more informative, it means that whenever you see the signal that says one after my censorship, you believe it more. So you are persuaded more. But then my optimal response is to water down the signal even more by censoring a little more. Right? So I can afford more censorship because the, sensor, the signal that I'm censoring is actually more informative in the first place, is more persuasive in the first place. But there is something that I said is peculiar to our model, which is the accountability. What's going on here? Well, the more transparent is the signal that you would observe if I wasn't censorship then the more valuable it is for you to have a liberal government. Because a liberal government allows you to see the entirety of the newspapers. It allows you to see the report of the bureaucrat that wanted to do the whistleblowing. And so the higher is Q, the higher is what the voters value of returning to liberalism. And so as an illiberal government, I know that I can afford to censor less. I need to let some information pass to keep you with me. I need to give you a more informative signal. And so again, if you want, the, what the paper is gonna tell you is a bit more about when one, you know, one uh, uh, of the two effects is, is dominating the other and, 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 and why. And finally, we can do comparative studies about the fall. And again, the kind of results are gonna be similar. I don't wanna, uh, bore you too much with comparative statics. Again, you know, some of it is going to be super intuitive and some of it is going to be a bit more complex. And which one is going to be complex? Again, of course, the interaction between uh, how transparent institutions are and what the level of stringency of uh, uh, the executive constraints uh, uh, is. And, uh, and, and, and if you want here, it's going to be kind of adding on the complexity of the two persuasion and accountability effects by adding also mechanical effects. And, and, and you know, which of these uh, effects dominates may depend as well on Q. And so we can add non-monotonic effects of Q on the probability of fall. And the, the probability of fall also determines the longevity of a liberal democracy. So it tells you how long they're gonna stay in power. Now you can see that I can bother you a lot with all this, this uh, specific results, but I think that what really matters to us is what do we learn in practice terms, like as political economists rather than as theorists, what, what is the message that we wanna send? The message we wanna send is that uh, if you have too many constraints, the one to increase how free we are, and they are also the good reason to a level, you know, <laughs> returning to a means question. We, we do want to respect minorities. We do want to have fair uh, processes. And you mentioned uh, um, preference for procedural uh, justice. You know, in some sense, you know, it's inbuilt here, right? That we care about these things, but too many constraints induce liberalism. Induce liberalism because sometimes voters that don't, maybe the people that vote that doesn't care about liberal, all the liberal constraints so much, will say, I want what I want, and I, I don't want to respect these things. I want to elect somebody who promised me that he's not going to care about it. But also it's telling us that there is an interaction between information and these constraints. And one way to think of this is, oh, if you want to increase constraints, you've got to repress the media, or if you want to in increase media freedom, you want to uh, decrease constraints. But I think a deeper story here is that 
technology can change the amount of information that is out there that cannot be controlled by a liberal government. A liberal government, when we were kids, still there was fundamentally one TV channel. They could control a lot of information. Even respecting the constitution to all possible ways, you would still have fundamentally one, one news channel. But today we live in a world in which if you want to respect liberal constitution, you have no control over leaks, right? We have leaks all the time. In this world, constraints on the executive are particularly risky for democracy because it's more likely that voters are gonna, so to speak, panic and demand a more resolute government that doesn't respect a uh, liberal constitution. And then a, a, a bit of a story about transparency that I think is important. Can, and that's why we insist on the voters, uh, you know, we have a representative voter, no, we have a pivotal vote. Why we insist on that? Because if you're, you know, I'm sure most of you are, are very familiar with this kind of results. I, Transparency in this model cannot be bad for the people that voted, right? People that voted is choosing. More information, exam, they cannot harm this voter. On the other hand, we can show that in some situation, transparency may be good for the people that voted, but it may be detrimental for every single voter who cares about liberty, even an absolute more than the people that voted. And so in democracy, the people that voted may not care much about liberty, but there might be minorities that care about liberty much more than him. And so it may be, transparency may be greatly detrimental for, for wealth. Finally, we do extend the model. Uh, yes, Arden. Gabriel, I, can, can you go back to the previous? I have a question about this a greater yeah. two point. So, I mean, in this model, what happens is that when you select an illiberal government, it has control over every single type of media, right? So it can censor sort of social media as well, even if it's a larger queue. I guess an alternative way of sort of thinking about this uh, sort of question is the following. The government has control over mainstream media, right? So it can sort of uh, choose a strategy for the mainstream media and then the citizens independently might also receive news from social media, Wikileaks and etc. And this is something that maybe the government cannot censor because it's much more difficult to censor compared to the mainstream media. Have you mm -hmm. thought about a case like this and do you think it's gonna overturn the... We haven't thought about it. My, my first order reaction is that I don't think that is the right assumption, but I mean, that I understand that that's a weak answer. Uh, I, but I'll tell you why. Mm -hmm. um, my, 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 the way I'm seeing the world around us is that the reason why Google and Facebook are fundamentally unregulated is because governments are, are, are very constrained. And, bec and the reason why they're very constrained is because parliaments and courts are going to constrain them. But, you know, the Chinese government wants to regulate Google, and it does. <laughs> it does really well, much more than, uh, than we realize. And, and similar for, you know, think about WikiLeaks. You know, WikiLeaks is possible because we, we all know that there are going to be immense political constraints in doing something about somebody who made information, leak, right? Assange is still fundamentally free and the reason why it's fundamentally free is because it's unpopular and hard in a liberal democracy to just hang on the first uh, on the first uh, pillar you find whoever leaks information right uh, and so but but again would the Chinese government have any problem with his own <laughs> his own Assange to to repress that kind of thing I don't think so right so I, I don't see that it's particularly harder um, but to a level, I said, I think that a little bit our model is capturing one aspect of that, although it's not uh, uh, at all uh, talking about technological difficulties of censorship. But one aspect of that is exactly our accountability effect. Right? What's an accountability effect is the fact that now that I know that there is Facebook out there, I know that if I didn't have the Chinese Communist Party governing, I could see all that information. And so the value of being in a free world is higher for me. And now you, Chinese government, need to deal with this. You can't do like you did in, in the 60s 
and just brainwash me every day. You need to get some information out there for me because otherwise you, you're completely not credible. Right? So I think that one aspect of it, we're talking about it, but not the technological one. Honestly, I don't think that the technological story that you said is the right assumption. But again, it's a, it's a weak answer because it's only, it's only my gut feeling, right? I don't have any, any real evidence on that. I just said, I disagree. But of course, <laughs> I disagree as a human being and not as a, as a scholar there. <laughs> I just say, it, I don't. It's an amazing way of defending your assumption, Gabriel. I really respect your stance on that. <laughs> <laughs> Doing my best. <laughs> oh, thank you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so we do we do something more, and I think that one of the things that we do uh, uh, talks a little bit also to, to the kind of things that you and and, and Amin have been talking about. But so one thing that we do is that we talk about uh, autocratization. Right? We talk about the fact that once you get a liberal government, this liberal government can do things to entrench power and to overthrow checks and balances. And, there are two main ways that we thought about discussing, but of course we can think of it manipulating all the parameters if you want. But the, the two main ways is, one is I can make security more valuable, right? So for example, I can start to have very aggressive diplomatic stance with uh, our enemy. And so you really need a strong government. You can't afford uh, uh, any more to return to liberalism. Or I can just, you know, stochastically be getting the chance of getting friends with the army and completely overthrow checks and balances and repress accountability for that. There's no elections anymore, okay? And so in this, you know, suppose that I, I call uh, Zeta and Gamma the probabilities that I can do this thing, right? And of course, if I, if I can, I will because there's no, no cost in doing it. So if you think that Zeta and Gamma, what are, what are they measuring? I'm measuring how weak checks and balances are in this constitution. If it's easy to, once you're in power, to just uh, uh, cause a war and stay in power forever, then checks and balances are not very strong. You can do too many things. If it's easy to just say, okay, no elections anymore, single party, things like that, then it means checks and balances are really, really weak, right? And so what happens in this world in which there are these possibilities and these possibilities are, are, are given by Zeta and Gamma? What happens is in the long run, there is no cycles. In the long run, every liberal democracy has a pr probability to become an autocracy. And if you wait for long enough, any liberal democracy will become an autocracy and stay there forever. So there are only two absorbing states, forever liberal democracy and autocracy. Forever. But the question here is, what's the effect of checks and balances? Well, checks and balances are actually a double-edged sword. Having stronger checks and balances, with zeta and gamma are smaller, they decrease the probability that a single illiberal democracy will turn out to be an autocracy per year, per period, okay? So it will slow down the process of autocratization, but it actually will make it more certain. Why we make it more certain? Because as a voter, the cost of accountability of electing an illiberal government is smaller if I think that the Supreme Court is super good, the militaries are very independent and so on. And so I'm more inclined to elect a strong leader at a liberal government thinking it's going to solve today's theta and then I'm going to return to liberalism when I need. But these kind of experiments are risky. And in the long run, it means that a, a democracy is either stably liberal or it's going to end up being an autocracy. Because if you open the opportunity for governments to abuse power, they would as soon as and we also talk about other long-term and persistent effects that I think some of your questions were hinting about. For example, if governments manipulate information, they will do so by replacing the heads of the bureaucracy. They will take independent bureaucrats who have been serving in, in, in the bureaucracy for, for decades and have know-how, and they will replace them with, with uh, you know, serves of the power. They will, you know, uh, get people in exile, uh, independent journalists will go away, uh, important newspapers will cease to exist. So in some sense, again, there is a persistent effect here, right? Once again, the liberal government here, Q is going to be ruined forever, perhaps. So let's make the assumption that it's ruined forever just for a, for a second. What is the implication of this uh, realistic addition to the model? Well, the implication is that we're going to have more stability. But interestingly, we're going to have more stability in both ways. 
We're going to have more stability of, an illiberal, of, a, of a liberal government because now the cost of getting an illiberal government is bigger, even if I think I'm going to return to liberality. But we're also going to have more stability once I get an illiberal government. Because again, since Q is ruined forever, the, that accountability effect that I said before, right? The value of returning to liberalism for the voter is now smaller. I have less of a value of doing that because the liberal democracy that I used to know is now ruined. I'm not going to return to it very fast. Okay, so I said that I want to end a little early, so I'm doing this. What did we do? We tried to construct a framework capturing some very, very elementary elements of the rise and fall of the liberal democracy. In this framework, what matters is this trade-off between liberty, security, and an indigenously determined dynamic accountability effect, accountability cost, we called it, of illiberalism. The aspect that having a liberal government means that in the future I will have less information and so I will be less able to choose the right government for me. In this framework, what triggers the rise of the liberal democracies is crisis. Crisis that make the value of security for voters greater. But once this, 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 the, the liberal democracy is triggered, it will live longer than what is optimal, even for the people that voted, who, as we said, might not be the one that cares about liberty the most. And so imagine how our cost is going to be for minorities. What, what is the problem of liberal democracy? Why liberal democracy is unstable in our framework? because it places too strong constraints on, on executive. We need constitutions that allow more flexibility, more emergency powers. Of course, we'll face trade-offs. The optimality of it, that we describe a bit in the paper, is going to be, of course, determined by many things, but in particular, is going to be determined by the level of transparency. Changes in technology that change the transparency of information, change the amount of information that voters observe, will demand different constitution in order to have liberal stability. We do find some descriptive, but I think suggestive support for our key ideas that economic insecurity is linked to preferences for illiberal governments, and that this is only true when executive constraints are stronger. And we finally argue that checks and balances was able to slow in the process to, of, of autocratization may actually make it more likely because they induce voters to experiment, if you want, with what they hope to be short-lived liberal spells, and then they may, you know, regret it for, for a term. And that's it. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Questions? I'll ask one question that I think everybody who presents any paper with Bayesian persuasion gets. It's yeah. What's your defense of the assumption that the, any liberal government can commit to a uh, censorship structure? Like this is a government that doesn't recognize any rule of law, uh, doesn't recognize the constitution, but somehow it can commit. I mean, are you just going? with the like, sort of a reputational story or is there something? No, else? no, no, definitely that's not going to be a reputational story. Um, I think that uh, there are two answers here. One is for the friends and one for the enemies. So you are friends, so I'll give you also the one for the friends. Thank you. Uh, but let me start with the one for the enemy, which I think it, it, is, it is a bit more, it, it, I don't think it's an unfair answer. I think it's a fair answer, but it's one but it's one that requires a bit of longer discussion perhaps than now, which is to what extent power is, is you know, absolute when it's absolute, right? So obviously power allows me to determine the structures to which things happen. I mean, in a complex society, right? Of course, in a, a home, uh, you, you can beat up people. I mean, not, not you can't, but, but it's my point, if, if you... <laughs> If you want, in some sense, if you have power in a small society, you can find the single individuals and beat them up. But uh, in, uh, in a complex society, power means to, to establish structures. And the structures that I can establish are a certain type of bureaucracy. I can replace the heads of those bureaucracy and I can 
make rules and make it very costly to, to whistle blow and to, and to uh, you know, go beyond your hierarchy and things like that. Or I can make the life of media very hard by mm -hmm. you know, uh, making it, you know, make laws that make libel uh, uh, trials very easy for public figures, for example, right? And so I can establish all these structures and, and I can establish system of punishments that, you know, systematically I punish journalists who say things that are unfavorable to me. But, you know, by and large, this is something that is visible by everybody. And once I did it I, for this period, right? For, I can change the next period, but for this period, I'm fundamentally, I'm stuck with this structure that I, that I established. And I cannot like fine tune it exposed. So I, I think that in, in terms of modeling censorship, you know, in, in terms of modeling other types of persuasion in a debate, I, I think it, it's more relevant the fact that you, you know, because I do run an experiment and, you know, the assumption of major persuasion is that if I run an experiment, I got to tell you the result. Well, obviously that's not true. We all, all of us run experiments and then, uh, and then we don't publish, especially because the editor is not going to let us unless we get a lot of stars on the, on the tables, right? Uh, and so in, in, in many realities, you don't commit, but in some realities, it's true, like in the case of censorship, it's true that I can only establish a climate that makes journalists not speak, but if one speaks, it speaks. I cannot come back. You will hear that message. I can punish the guy, I can kill him, but you know, at this point it's been visible that despite my climate of, uh, of tension, one person has spoken and has been killed. And everybody sees that. I think you know, each of us have seen censorship working and we know that sometimes there are messages coming out. Uh, that said, that was the answer for the enemy. The answer to the friend is that I think Is it really that the unrealistic assumption? I mean, I have, a, I have a model in which the only thing that matter are two parameters. One is called liberty, one is called security. And then there's a government that will do whatever is written in the constitution and another one that will do bad things to me, but also protect me from... The model is living on, on the leap of faith that we're capturing essential elements rather than realism. And I think that once we get into that state of mind, I don't think the Bayesian persuasion assumption here is, is one that worries me, right? It's, it's a very convenient way to talk about the fact that somebody can manipulate information. And we know that there are going to be ways that are going to be harder and require a lot of machinery about, you know, there's going to be a government who has a type, the type uh, determines whether it can or it cannot uh, uh, get some signal. And so that you don't have necessarily complete unraveling because there is still a chance. It's going to be so more complex just to avoid the assumption that, as I said, I don't think is particularly crazy of saying, you know, oh, I'm going to set up a policy that says I'll shoot people who say things against me and then we'll see what happens. No, I agree. I think it's a. I think it's a useful tool. I agree with the essence of your statement. It's, it's a useful tool to sort of put in your model to sort of give the idea that there is some information manipulation going on, and that's what you need for the purpose of this model. Uh, exactly for the purpose of this model, I don't need more realism than that. Yeah, fair enough. I, I'm just trying to collect answers from various people adopting this model on how they. I hope I, I, I rank. Uh, <laughs> I hope I rank high enough. <laughs> I'll announce my rankings later. <laughs> um, there is a question from one of the attendees, Ali Arslan, so I'm going to unmute him. Oh, yes. Uh, do I see? Uh, can you hear me now? Uh, yeah, hi, Ali. Yes, I hear you. Uh, okay, great. Uh, so I have um, two questions regarding change, uh, fall of illiberal democracy. So. Um, the first one is uh, change, the type of change, whether it's going to be violent or peaceful or democratic, uh, is determined by what? So, I mean, if after what extent of um, censorship, for example, 
does voters decide to uh, change the government through um, elections and, or through uh, violence? This is the first uh, question I want to ask. Uh, because, um, for example, in, in the events of Arab Spring, we had um, normal protesters and some violent um, protesters in different countries. And all of these states were applying different levels of censorship. So this, this is why I am asking it. And the second one, the second question is, um, if, an, if an illiberal democracy falls, uh, democratization occurs in, in, in which environments? In, in, in those that have uh, strong, um, strong institutions, but we say that the strong institutions can lead to uh, autocracy, autocratization anyway. So, or in, in, in places where institutions are weak or so. So yeah, the, the change to democracy, uh, the, uh, coming back to democracy happens under which foundation? Yeah, these are the two questions that I had in mind. Uh, thank you, Ali. Um, I think, I mean, I had the temptation of answering the first question. But I, I should add the caveat that my answer is not an answer about this model or this paper, which doesn't mean that I shouldn't try to answer, but, but, but I need to place that caveat, right? I do not have in this, in this article, in this presentation, I do not have a theory of, of violence. And so I, what I need to think about, and I think we all should think about, is what does it mean to have um, a violent revolution? And I think that a violent revolution, you know, the way that many of us have been modeling it, again, because of restriction to how easy it is to model things, not because we think differently. But if you think about uh, Darona Gemoglu has been, uh, or Ajemoglu, uh, 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 you, you guys will tell me. <laughs> you had it right the first time. <laughs> okay, Ajemoglu uh, uh, has been, you know, modeling that is, 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 is that you can force things violently because you are the population and you and you do, but it's, it's it's probably much more complex, right? And so the reason why we protest in violent or peaceful ways is also signals that we're going to try to send, and who are we sending these signals to? I don't know. If you think about in the context of uh, countries in which the militaries are strong, these are signals that we're sending to the militaries. How willing are you? To repress because you know if you have to repress peaceful demonstration it's easier you have to be less violent yourself you'll have to uh, get less blood on your hands if you have to repress violent demonstrations you have to get blood on your hands and you know how much political support you're going to have for a violent repression of, of demonstrations even when they're violent themselves right so i don't have that theory in this in this paper but i think it's an important uh, is an, i think it's an important question uh the second part of your question is, when are we getting back to, to, to democracy? What are the, to liberal democracy? What are the, the, the elements that increase the probability of getting back to a liberal democracy? And, and the answer is, 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 is here, right? So if I end up with an illiberal government, how long will I stick, how, how long do I stick with the illiberal government? I stick with an illiberal government for longer if my constitution is one that is less good for the people to vote, less flexible, is one that is too stringent on the limits uh, for, the, for the executive. I, I, I made the constitution too liberal. Making it too liberal made, the liber made the, uh, life too easy for a liberal government to stay in power for longer. Right? So I want to have a constitution that has enough flexibility. I don't want the most flexible constitution possible because otherwise, you know, that's the question I was asking at, at the beginning. Uh, otherwise, if, if this constitution doesn't give me any freedom. Obviously, it will, be, it will give me zero L in the first place. It's not really good. But I want to have the greatest possible uh, uh, amount of constraints, a good amount of liberty, conditional on making the people that voter not want to abandon that constitution and get a liberal. Uh, also, uh, one of the messages of the paper is that the effect of other types of institutions, like the quality of the bureaucracy, the quality of the media, which are important in, in, in 21st century democracy, is, is complex because it is mediated by 
other elements of the Constitution. If you think that you live in a world in which uh, typically the constraints of the constitutions are going to be, uh, for example, a bit too large, if you want, okay, so pi is greater than a half, uh, then actually better institutions uh, in, in terms of bureaucracy and media may harm. But if you think uh, that instead you live in a world in which constitutions are typically not too, too stringent, then actually uh, more information may decrease uh, the ability of uh, the liberal government to stay in power, and so it makes it easier to return to liberalism. So this is my answer to the, the second part of the question. Because the second part of the question, it is something that we address directly in this, in this model. Oh, okay, thank you, thank you for the answers. Thank, thank you for the question. All right, other questions? Um, all right, uh, it is, what is it, 11 p.m. right now there? Um, yeah, okay. <laughs> Uh, it's only 10, 10 or 5. Ah, that's fine. <laughs> okay, so you can actually relax after that. All right, I think it's we don't have sharing. any more questions. So I'd like to thank you on behalf of the department, Gabriele. This was great and we appreciate all your time in giving us this presentation and answering our questions. Uh, uh, thank you. This was, uh, was great. Uh, actually, very interesting discussions. Uh, my feedback. I, I think I speak also for Bartu, who I see in fact <laughs> doing <laughs> yes, he said that this was very useful feedback. And uh, it was good to see you and very nice to get to know Ayun and, uh, and Amin uh, earlier on today. Uh, I've seen some other pieces. Uh, nice to see you. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, we are going to be able to. Uh, hopefully, we're going to be able to have you here physically at some point in the future as well. Would love to. And of course, yeah. uh, many of you should, once borders are open, consider a nice trip uh, down under. Uh, yeah, I, it's especially <laughs> now that it's the beginning of the summer over there. Our jealousy yeah. has just multiplied. <laughs> Although, you know, if it goes like last year, you're not going to like it because everything was burning. So it depends. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you very much again. Thanks a lot. And Thank you. Have a good day, guys. You have a good night. Don't forget to send us the recording. Uh, all right. All right. I'll do that. I'll do that. Thank you. It needs to sort of uh, process itself. And it's, yeah, yeah, it's going to take a while. Okay. All right. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Goodbye. Goodbye.